Hey everyone, welcome back to Jetson AI Labs. This month, we're super excited. We have Jules Wynn and Marcus Drellen from the University of Minnesota's Department of Biomedical Engineering. And they're here to show off their amazing neuroprosthetic hand, uh, which is brain controlled and does all types of amazing things, which I can't even get into myself, but we'll bring them on shortly. And uh, along with me, as always, we have my great co-host, Dana Sheehan from NVIDIA's Deep Learning Institute and Jim Jetson Hacks Benson. Hey guys, how are you this month? Good. Doing well. Good. Awesome, awesome. So typically at the beginning of the show here, we like to cover some news and tidbits that have come out in the past month. Um, so bring up my screen here. We have a couple of things to share with you guys before we get started. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, we have this Jetson Community Projects page. And it's a great repository of all of these cool open source projects for Jetson that uh, use artificial intelligence or deep learning in some capacity. And generally every month we pick uh, the best project from that month and award it the project of the month status. So the most recent one that uh, we awarded was uh, this cornhole robot. And uh, it, they basically somehow got an industrial KUKA arm, mounted uh, Jetson onto it, and uh, wrote computer vision algorithms so that it can automatically uh, shoot the beanbags into uh, the cornhole game. Uh, here's a video of it working. Um, so you can see there's like a camera on the end there, and it finds wherever you uh, put the pad and shoots the bean bags right into there. And it works with like amazing accuracy. I don't think I want to compete with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think later in the game, they did have a competition and the <laughs> robot was like, got like a hundred percent accuracy with it. Uh, well, that's and no fun. <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah, not, not very friendly for competition terms, but um, it, it is all open source if you guys want to check out how it works. It uses OpenCV and some different vision algorithms. And they did make it a collaborative robot. You saw here there's like this little safety LIDAR that they have running so that the if you walk up next to it, uh, the robot won't hit anybody by accidents. And uh, this whole, it's called Cobots, collaborative robots. It's really big in manufacturing space uh, these days so that people can work more closely in tandem with robots and not have to be behind cages or things like that. And this project was made by a YouTube channel called Dave's Armory, and they did it in collaboration with uh, the Hacksmith, who we had on a couple months ago that did the, the Jedi training drone. So you can see they're actually playing the, the game with it. But yeah, I encourage you guys to check out this community projects page if you guys aren't already familiar with that. And there's lots of really awesome projects on there. Um, if you're looking for something to do with your Jetson. Uh, another uh, little news item we had is that NVIDIA launched the latest version of TensorRT uh, last week, TensorRT version 8, and it comes with a bunch of new performance improvements and new features and uh, improved network support. A lot of the, the headlines were around the improved performance for BERT, which is a natural language processing model. Uh, for doing question answering or doing uh, uh, voice intelligent queries for uh, virtual assistants and things like that. And uh, I know some of you have been asking, when can we get TensorRT 8 for Jetson? And the good news is we have a new version of Jetpack coming out very soon, Jetpack 4.6, which will include TensorRT version 8 uh, in it. And that should be up early next month. We're in the final stages of preparation for that. And I've been rebuilding all of the containers for PyTorch and TensorFlow and all of that stuff. So that'll be coming out very shortly and we'll support all of the Jetson devices for that. I know Dana, you've been working on some containers for new versions. Yes, of we'll be here. along with that, the containers that Dusty built. Uh, are the ones that the DLI for the getting started DLI for the nano are based on. So we will, of course, update those in all the languages that we support. Cool, yeah. Well, and I just saw a question here, a uh, person asking about when will uh, Xavier devices be back in stock in North America? And it, it good 
good to address this because I know there are a lot of uh, out of stock gaps right now. And uh, unfortunately, it's due to a lot of the semiconductor shortages that have been going around. You might have heard of those in the news earlier this year. And unfortunately, those are on log lead and have flowed down to us now. So there have been some component shortages for like memory and the storage chips and things like that. But, uh, you know, our supply chain guys are working 24 seven to um, get more units shipped out soon. So hopefully you'll, you'll see those back in stock relatively soon. Um, uh, Jim, do you have anything new going on in your neck of the woods? Well, let's see. We published a video on the Jets and Hacks channel. I just put a link in the chat to see that. And we opened up the Race Car J shop again. So there's various parts and pieces that are now available. <laughs> We're suffering from the same issue that NVIDIA is having, which is there aren't any parts suppliers that could actually ship things right now. Yeah, but we've had some pretty good response on the platforms and things of the mechanical things, which are relatively simple to get now. So I'm already on the second batch of those. So that's been oh, kind that's of fun. awesome. Yeah, and I know that a bunch of these race car circuits, like Chris Anderson runs one out there in Oakland, DIY Robo Cars, I think it is, and a lot of those are getting back in action after a hiatus during the pandemic. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, these autonomous race cars are really a lot of fun because there's a really great competitive aspect to them. And it, it used to be that these were just like time trials, like one car would go on the track at once, but now the people's algorithms and AI has progressed to the point where they actually just run them in Grand Prix mode and there's uh, multiple cars on the track running simultaneously racing each other. Right, and, the, so, and another kind of outgrowth of the, this uh, particular kind of niche has been the Indianapolis Autonomous Challenge. So they're just starting to get those cars up and running. They're going to have a, an actual race in October, I believe. So that's that's pretty exciting. Same group of people that are involved in Formula One temp. Yeah, and I, I've seen over time, like we started with these small scale ones and over time the community has gotten these bigger and bigger and bigger until they're at the point where they're actual like cars or go-karts. And I know our, our good friend, uh, you know, Dr. Jack Silberman from University of San Diego, he's involved in those larger efforts and has been working with one called the e go kart. That it's it's not like a full size car, but it's like a real car that's autonomous and uh, or, or go kart for that matter. And it, it's really impressive the um, you know progression that it's gone through and is really good training for folks that want to get involved with the self driving car industry because these little RC cars basically it, it's all of the brains that you would need on a full car, it's just without all of the, you know, you don't actually need a, a full automotive or have a license to drive on the road and, and all of that stuff. Yeah, I think uh, Jack, the right, Jack went over to Hawaii to work with the University of Hawaii group. So they, um, the cart, the uh, cart that you mentioned is kind of the next step, the bridge from the simulators to the cart. And then when you go to the, basically their Indy Lights car, cars so that's kind of the next stepping stone so that's what they're working on now is they've run the simulations they've had the races get it up and running on the carts and then they'll be racing in october there on the indy lights cool yeah and we hope to have jack on a few future episode here because he's got a lot of really awesome stuff to show one more but thing to mention if y'all could hit the like button that would help Feed the algorithms. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Jim, Jim knows to, that's part of always missing from my videos is the like, share, and subscribe disclaimer. But Jim's got it down. He's a true All expert. All you have to do is he like ours. So we don't care about sharing or, or, or you know, <laughs> subscribing, but like us. That's yeah. all we care about. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so without further ado, we have, we have so much to discuss uh, with Jules and Marcus. So we're going to bring them on because they've done some just really incredible work. Uh, here we go. Hey guys. Hello everyone. Hello. Everybody so, wave. <laughs> I'm Jules and here Marcus. Yes. Nice nice to meet you and thank nice you so much you. for for coming Welcome. on the show. Thank you for having us. So um, before we uh, we start just a little bit of glamour. So this is a 
a big project that involved several university and in, in, in institution. So myself and Marcus represent the Professor Zi Yang group at uh, in biomedical engineering at the University of Minnesota. Our collaborator include uh, Professor Yao Shi in computer science, who designed a lot of uh, deep learning architecture, and uh, Dr. Edward Kiefer from NERV Incorporated in Dallas, Texas, who designed a microelectroarray that go into the patient, and uh, Dr. Jonathan James from uh, UC Southwestern, also in Dallas, Texas, who is a neurosurgeon that uh, um, performed operation and implant the electro into the patient. And uh, okay, so with that out of the way, let um, let me talk about what we have right here. Sure. Yeah, it's really an amazing collaboration that you've done to to build this device. So yeah, sh show it to us and explain what it does and what purpose it serves. Yeah. Can you have share the screen? So absolutely. Here we go. Let me start with uh, sh showing the video here. So what you see is uh, amputees control a prosthesis hand his finger of a prosthetic hand with his nerve in the face. And he used his able hand to show all the audience what he want to do and what the hand respond accordingly. So these are the nerves in his arm that exist that still are there. And he's, yes. he's using them just as he would to move his own hand. Exactly. So, okay. So what is he imagining right now while he's doing this? So he moving his, uh, you can say phantom hand, just like you move the hand, like you close, close your eye and then imagine the hand is still there and try to move his finger. So he's imagining moving both hands together right now to, to demonstrate for us how, yes. how it works. Yeah. That is so interesting. So we have a uh, divide right, right here that you, we have a, a nerve interface that's a uh, that designed by our, our group that acquired the nerve signal and then it fed into the NVDA Jetson Nano that we uh, managed to uh, design a deep learning AI that running uh, inferior only on all uh, on this device and the whole system is uh, self contained portable there no external connection with any uh, device or so the decoding happen all the signals processing acquisition and AI decoding, it happened on here to control its finger of the prosthetic hand. So this project, we um, try to address uh, several, a lot of problem with uh, commercially available device. So uh, first of all, is dexterity. So if you are amputees or you know someone amputees, so then you realize that the, the processes in, um, you know, commercial process is very limited. It usually only have like two degree of freedom, like open and close. So, and uh, if you see some, the hand doing something like making some different gesture, making a, a thumbs up or pinching, it actually a pre-programmed gesture. So you have a list of gesture that you can uh, switch between by clicking a button on the hand itself, or you have some app to switch between that. And then the actual control is just open and close. And secondly, um, um, so our processing is different in that, you know, we have individual, fun, individual finger control, all five finger, and also the, the wrist movement. Uh, secondly, that is the intuitiveness. So with the commercial system, right, you're not actually thinking about control the hand when you open and close. You're actually switching different uh, re, uh, residue muscle that's still on your hand. And then there is several sensor, they call um, Mayo electric sensor or EMG sensor that on your hand that record this residue muscle and then you open and close with this muscle. So it's not a natural movement. And you uh, when you want to control the hand, you have to actively think about uh, you know, twisting a certain muscle. And it can be, can be very mentally exhaustive if you do it like all day, 24 hours. Uh, oh. So our work is different because we have the nerve interface here that record the signal from the nerve, the residue nerve inside the patient arm. So we are decoding actual, uh, when, when the patient want to move the hand, they actually think about moving the hand, not stretching different uh, muscle. And thusly, and also very important that we also have a neurofeedback 
So you can see on the hand here, there is several touch sensor. So when the hand touch something, it actually can you know, use this signal to and modulate, uh, uh, deliver an electrical neural stimulation through the same device back to the nerve to tell the, the patient that you, know, you touch something and it can, the patient can even differentiate between light and hot touch. Oh, so there's some haptic feedback too yes. happening there. Yeah, that, the, that's really the, incredible. Oh, sorry, not on the portable device yet, um, but that's another project that we've been working oh, on. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, you guys do seem to have a lot of future plans for this. And I encourage, the, there's a link in the description to their actual paper here. And it, it's a very interesting read of how they put this whole system together and the whole processing pipeline for it. Um, and even just like the mechanics of it are really incredible, how you can fit all of those servos into such a small space. So you're doing this with a, with a, a deep learning neural network on the nano, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how did you train that? Is it the same for everybody or does it have to be sort of individualized? So it is uh, completely different for uh, each people. So each people, uh, the if people, when we do a training, right, they will you know, sit down and then try to wiggle his finger, maybe 10 times, 100 times. And then we, we do a sort of a, a mirror movement. That's when you imagine moving one hand and they do exactly on the the, 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 the amputated hand. And then we use the able hand to record the ground truth data with the data club and then record neural signal from the amputated hand. And then we use this CAP data set to train a neural network. Uh, the whole process usually, um, if everything works, you know, yeah. In reality, there are a lot of problems, but if everything works, it takes around one to two hours to uh, record the, the neural signal and then another two, one or two hours to actually train a neural network. So if you look at the, the paper, you can see how this, uh, here, the, the, here one of our patients during a, a training section. So you can see his uh, uh, amputated hand with record neural data from there and his able hand that provide a ground truth signal. So you must have the able one to, to provide the ground truth. So in his mind, he's imagining all these things with both mm -hmm. our, both hands identically. Yes. Um, yeah, that is, that's great. That's a great use of what's already there and so that it can be intuitive. That's wonderful. Yeah. So and you basically have him move his existing hand and then you're collecting the data from the nerve endings and essentially training a, a model to translate between the two. Is, and, but, is that the and, gist of it? Yes. And in his mind, he's moving both hands identically. Mm -hmm. He's trying to move both hands uh, identically. So that the nerves are stimulated. Mm. Gotcha. Because that data glove captures the pose mm -hmm. uh, of his existing hand. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And it, it looks like you just train this on like a normal PC and it doesn't require some large cluster or Super yeah, computer so, uh, most of the time we train on our own just a normal PC. I have a 1080 Ti that uh, do most of the work. Yeah. And then where, after you uh, got the optimized model, right, you have the end result model, just download this model onto the chest and nano. So the nano is say only do deep learning inference in real time. Gotcha. So, so how many data points do you have to get to, uh, to create a pretty good model? You said an hour or two of work to gather the data. So I would say uh, around a uh, hundred thousand or two hundred thousand data points. Hmm. Uh, 40, 40 movement gestures, but um, but everything in between, sort of as he's doing it. Yeah, and also depend on how many uh, catcher you want to train on. Uh, you can you know, we go a thumb, we go the index, and then making a fist, making a you know. A, Thumbs up, for example. So there are a lot of different uh, gestures that you can train. We only focus on around, usually we're looking at like uh, around 10 different gestures, but you imagine all the combination that your hand can do. Mm -hmm. it, it will definitely take more time if you want to include uh, uh, all of them. Yeah. If you want another example, um, I did this exact same training setup uh, with my hands, but I just used uh, EMG recording on one of my hands and then used mirror movement training on the other hand. Uh, and I did, um, I think, 
40 movements of each of each finger uh, before I was able to get into the 90 upper 90 percent of accuracies. Uh, that's not an exact representation of an amputee, of course. Um, but no, but yeah, gives it gives you an idea of how much data you're going to need. Yeah. That's not too bad at all, though. I know Dana, like in our DLI courses in the JetBot, generally we'll collect like 100 images or so just to train a model that's like very particular to a particular scenario. And so it, doing like 40 or 50 gestures, that's not too bad at all. But um, how many features, like if we were doing visual stuff where we've got our features are represented by all the different pixels in the image. So what kind of, what are the features that are collected? I mean, it's the nerves, but I don't know what a nerve signal looks like. Yeah, so uh, we are uh, recording from uh, 16 channel of uh, nerve data and then each channel we extract different feature. Each channel we extract uh, in total 14 feature. And then you also have the, 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 the time dimension. So we use around one second of past data to predict the current movement. So around 50 data points in time series. So in total, you have 16 time 14 time 50. So the signals that are coming over are analog. And you're saying that you're capturing a certain number of data points along the analog signal. And like the, I don't know, the voltage or whatever it is that you're translating. Yeah, it's it, it voltage. But it uh, already converts to digital signal. So the, the purpose of this chip right here is to amplify the neural signal and then convert from analog to digital. And so. Mm -hmm. All the Jason received a stream of uh, digital data that just through a normal uh, micro USB uh, cable. Hmm. So, and you mentioned this is time series data. Does that mean you're using like a recurrent model or an RNN to process it? Yeah, we use a recurrent uh, neural network. So, uh, if you can share the screen, you can see the, how the network looks like. So this is the uh, signal processing uh, uh, procedure and the uh, neural network. Like it, I know it's a very shallow network, but we have to fix this thing, uh, you know, running real time on the JSON. So we try our, our best. And from day one, we have um, always uh, tried to do recurrent neural network because we, we know that uh, recurrent neural network is better at uh, handling uh, time series data. So in our previous paper, we actually uh, implement a bunch of, uh, we have a recurrent neural network, we have CNN, we have a bunch of uh, standard machine learning like SVM, uh, random forest, and then we compare all of them, all of their performance, and RNN always come, come up on top in terms of accuracy. Uh, very interesting. So did you use like a common framework to implement this, like PyTorch or TensorFlow or one of those? Yeah. Yeah, we use PyTorch for, for this particular implementation. Ah, awesome. That's really cool. You can just use that and integrate it with an actual device like this. It's um, not dissimilar to robotics. It's just integrated with a person in this uh, this example. Yeah, so our, um, uh, our, our goal is like, uh, we, we want to use a standard library like PyTorch, and then we design and testing everything on the desktop uh, PC. And when it worked right, then we could translate um, all this into the JSON nano, and then it yeah, it very likely that it we work exactly, you know, the same. It's just slower. So, gotcha. uh, for example, like Marcus work a lot of his work involving how to translate all of our existing uh, decoding on the computer on the desktop PC into something that work very efficiently on the JSON nano. Did it take you guys a while to find a model that worked or was there challenges during the development to get the fingers essentially to move how the person was thinking they would? Or can you walk us through the development process of, of the models and um, any challenges you had? Yeah, of course, that, uh, we, we started doing this thing from uh, I think 2017, but uh, it take up um, quite like maybe one or two years to eventually come up with the model that works. So we, we try a bunch of, of things. We first, of course, we just use simple machine learning. And then when it doesn't work as we want it, we move to deep learning. And we try different architecture, uh, different uh, uh, number of layers as well. 
and especially like different way to process the data. Like at first we try to just uh, decoding the raw data directly, but it's just like too too, too much to handle. And then you know, one of our team member like figure out a way to extract different feature, and it, it greatly reduced the, the number of uh, data point uh, to be processed. And uh, yeah, that's what you're seeing in the, the end result that we have. So when you talk about the feature extraction, is that like performing Fourier transforms on it or some other type of pre-processing before the RNN? So actually in the next figure, you can see the list of all the features that we have. Yeah, so we have uh, 14 different features. It, um, you know, something simple like just uh, zero crossing or I mean absolute value to a little bit more complicated. You know, you see it down the list. Uh, we have, uh, we don't really exactly know which feature is the best. So we just try to just include everything that we can find on the literature. And the, the good thing about now deep learning is that you don't really, uh, don't really care which particular thing work, right? You just throw all these things into a neural network and then let it learn by itself. <laughs> Yeah, that that's really interesting. In some other time series stuff I've worked on in the past, there there are a couple algorithms like forward feature selection or covariance uh, matrix estimation, which you can use to determine which features are actually contributing value um, to your model. But that that's very interesting. Like it, you don't actually need to do that. It, a, a lot of times you might do that if you have too much data going in if you're resource constrained or processing constrained but um if you're not then you can just feed in all the data and the model can glean even more information from that so speaking of the performance did you have any challenges with that getting this whole system to run in real time or um you know what type of um, modifications did you need to make in order to embed this on a small battery powered nano that actually ran on the uh, arm without an external PC? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, accuracy is one of our first and most important uh, metric. So maybe like uh, previously, like 90, 80 percent of our time, we try to focus how to improve the accuracy. We try different uh, configuration of electro, different uh, kind of uh, processing the data and different neural network to get it into the order like at least 90%, 90-95% because, um, you know, when you uh, can try to control your hand, right? Imagine if like out 10 times you want to make a fist and then one of these things, it may do something else. It can be very frustrated for, for the user. So our first and only goal is to get it to at least a 90, better in like more than 95% accuracy. And sure. later in the, the project, we um, mark us, we focus more on the efficiency, how to make it maintain the same accuracy, but uh, uh, a lot uh, consume less power so it can be put on the JSON. Want to add anything on, the, on this? Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about the uh, actual implementation on the JSON nano if you want. Um, so, uh, pretty much uh, what I did was I took um, the uh, MATLAB implementation uh, that had been previously developed and then uh, tried to format that into like a small uh, currently Python application uh, that pretty much has uh, one thread that uh, sits around and looks for data, uh, looks to see if there's any d data available from both of the Scorpio or the neural recorders on there. Uh, another thread that does uh, data pre-processing, so uh, stuff like uh, downsampling the data set, uh, doing some uh, pretty much uh, bandpass filtering, as well as anti-aliasing, um, and then also feature extraction on that thread. And then a separate thread um, that pretty much waits for uh, a packet of features to be available to decode, and then uh, runs that through uh, the, a network that's deployed on the Jetson. Uh, and then uh, sends the whatever uh, output result it gets to the uh, robotic hand. Uh, and so communication between the different threads uh, is just done through queues uh, or uh, like self-implemented queues that I did. 
and there's some like little, uh, not very fun to talk about, but like uh, some little like tweaking modifications you have to do. So for example, like uh, uh, the, um, the, the neural network thread that actually uh, ships the uh, data, the, the feature extracted data into a neural network can't keep up with the data preprocessor because that thing can ship through ship data through faster. So what you have to do is you have to subsample from that queue in a certain way so you can like discard all the data and then or discard all the data points except for the most recent one. Or if you know you have enough time to, for example, do two predictions by the time you're going to get another uh, output from the data preprocessing thread, you can uh, subsample in a different way. Um, but a lot of that stuff was uh, just like me sitting there trying to uh, like look at the queue size and see if um, uh, I can do like little modifications on that type of stuff. Uh, so your predictions, when it creates a prediction, what does that look like and how do you translate that into something physical? So, or do you want me to? Yeah, sure. uh, Okay. Uh, so um, a prediction on uh, all the networks is a, a one by 14 uh, matrix and uh, it's 14 because we have 14 degrees of freedom that we can uh, actually extract from. Uh, but the neural, uh, the Jetson deployed neural networks only look at um, six features, which is uh, flexion of all uh, five fingers as well as fist formation. Oh, the, wrist, that's the wrist rotation. Oh, yeah. I, I also did fist formation with the EMG one. But yeah, uh, uh, wrist, wrist rotation or uh, uh, fist movement, depending on. Uh, if we're talking about nerves or uh, the EMG. Um, and uh, pretty much that is uh, some type of, uh, it, it's just a floating point value between uh, zero and one. Uh, and we kind of heuristically uh, see um, based off of just like mostly visuals at, the, at this point on where we should threshold that value to whether we want to do a movement or not. Um, in the future, uh, we're hopefully going to try to like do some more natural movement stuff or where, where, for example, if you have uh, like 0.7 as an output, that means you want a certain type of velocity. But right now it's just, are yeah. we moving the finger or are we not moving the finger? Okay. Um, and oh, I, sorry, I should uh, add this uh, as well. If, you, if there's uh, zero for an output, that just means the finger goes back to um, whatever this position is, uh, the default uh, hand position. So. Yeah, that, that's what the output looks like. Yeah, and uh, zero and one from the output from the Jetson, it just con just send it into this uh, hand controller right here that we uh, custom my controller, and it basically just move the finger. So if it's uh, one, and you drive the finger forward, and it's zero, you drive the finger backward. And yeah, that's it. So this this is really amazing, but it also leaves room for huge additions. You know, with more power, more. Uh, I don't know, you know, all going forward as the technology improves, you'll have all these sophisticated things to add as well. Yeah, right? absolutely. And it does all this it, with just yeah. what's there now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Could also do... it, uh, we're just li limited by the, the physical, me the mechanical of this hand. So this is actually a co com co commercial hand that we just remove all the controller inside and then we customize our own controller and the hand only have five actuated finger. So each of the finger have a motor inside that can move forward, backward, that's it. And uh, some hand, they have the wrist control as well, like the rotation. This one doesn't have, but some of these have. Uh, although like uh, some of our experiment, we can decode up to 14 features, like Marcus mentioned, for 14 degree of freedom, sorry. But uh, each of the hand doesn't have uh, this much degree of freedom to control. Yeah. On that and, particular hand, could you go over kind of what the materials are and how many actuators are actually in it? Yeah, so if you, uh, some somebody may recognize this, it's uh, an iLIM Access hand. It uh, comes from the company Touch Bionic. Thing. It, it bought by someone else. But, uh, you know, inside here, there a motor that just dry, you know, this finger forward and each of these motor in can be independently controlled. We you know you have some wiring that uh, you know, we go from each of these finger to the controller board right here to dry the hand. And how does the Jetson talk to the controller board? Yep so the Jetson just send over uh, a class classification prediction like zero and one 
So one, it means you uh, close uh, the hand, and oh, zero, it means open the hand. Okay, and over do, like I2C or? It, it's over yeah. either Bluetooth or serial. Um, oh, okay. Uh, or serial connection. Interesting. Yeah. One, yeah. One. It's a relatively so, slow connection yes. to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of a cool thing that we call it Bluetooth. So sometimes, you know, you just like, can remove this hand and then put it on a table and then control it remotely. <laughs> <laughs> like, what like what it does... Like in the Adams family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can really watch it. So what causes Absolutely. probably the greatest delay as far as from the signal to the actuation? Where are the biggest delays that you're working on? I think the biggest de delay right now is uh, just uh, the deep learning inference. So on the JSON, we estimate 90% uh, of the processing time and power is dedicated to uh, deep learning inference. And on the signal acquisition, uh, filter, feature extraction, you know, we optimize, marker and I optimize so much, it's just like a fraction, maybe two, three milliseconds, something like that. So that's why we don't really care like how, how much feature we throw in because Anyway, the processing is very fast. Why the deep learning, it will take a lot of uh, power. And the total, is, we're looking at something like 50 to 100 millisecond uh, input lag. You can, yeah, you can use this, this term for the controller. So two, two suggestions for you. One, if without changing PyTorch or anything, you can, I don't know, Marcus, if you've tried running the model in half mode, like FP16 mode, um, you no, essentially just, yeah, you just call like dot half on your tensors and it'll it. change it from full FP32 to FP16. That, that'll give you a good performance boost because Nano and the other Jetsons have FP16 floating point cores within them. Um, and then the other suggestion is to try TensorRT, which will give you you know, it can give you up to several times speed up over native PyTorture, TensorFlow. And my colleague has a really nice tool called Torched TRT, which is just like a transparent layer that you you just call this function on your PyTorch model, and then it, you know, makes the TensorRT engine for it. And then you just use it like a normal PyTorch model like you always would have. So you don't have to change your code really at all. And you can see very quickly if the model will work in TensorRT for you. And if it does, that that's great. And it will speed up your inference by, by a lot. And it does support RNNs and things like that. So it, it could stand a good chance of working if uh, you give it a go sometime. It's not supposed to sacrifice much in no. accuracy, right? No, the, yeah. the accuracy is the same as you would get uh, it's just it, it performs optimizations like constant folding or kernel fusion. For example, it, it's very common in deep learning to have like convolution followed by an activation function or convolution followed by dropout or other things. And it knows like it can merge those into one CUDA kernel and save you from executing those different layers at the different times. So uh, on one hand, we have QDNN, which is all these different layer libraries and Lumina that all the deep learning frameworks integrate. And then on top of that uh, is TensorRT, which has knowledge of like the actual network graph. So it can optimize and fuse where it can, whereas QDNN is just at the layer level and doesn't really understand network topology, so to speak. Um, but turns out there are a lot of benefits that you can get from, from doing that. And also, I think Mark, you are trying to make a C implementation of this. Yeah, I um, I'm I'm currently working on uh, a C slash C plus plus implementation uh, for um, pretty much all of the uh, uh, pretty much converting the, the Python model to a C slash C plus plus implementation uh, because um, of course Python isn't exactly the fastest language in the world, um, and uh, also like the global interpreter lock in Python. Uh, inhibits yeah. a lot of threading. When you're threading, it's a real problem. And generally, like the only way around that is to run multiple processes. And That's but that has did. limitations. Yeah. So you you can get a big benefit. And you can also, you can still use PyTorch uh, if, if you've tried LibTorch yet or 
the those libraries are in the PyTorch wheels that we publish, like the actual libtorch binaries installed into the Python pip directory in there. So you'll find all of that stuff and can run your PyTorch model through C++ if you want, or TensorRT has C++ API as well. So there are ways that you don't you don't need, well, I guess what I'm getting at is you don't need to go about like implementing your own RNN implementation in C++. You can still use Torch or TensorRT from C and C++ without having to rewrite all the guts of the actual neural network stuff. Because mm -hmm. most of PyTorch is actually implemented in C anyways. Like if you actually dig into the code, it's all in like the A10 tensor library and QDNN and the Python uh, APIs for PyTorch are a relatively shallow layer on top of all of the C and C++ code that implements it underneath. So could you tell us a little bit more about the neural chip that you implant and kind of some, some of the uses for that? Yep, so definitely. So this is our, like uh, the thing that we, our, our, our group, Professor Zi Yang and I have been working for this maybe a little bit over 10 years now. So we are uh, starting designing neural recorder and neural stimulator. Neural recorder means it acquires neural signal from your nerve or brain or whatever nervous system. And neural stimulator, it doing the reverse, it transfer uh, so that's electrical for stimulation. Your touch thing. Yeah. Yes, and can be a lot of other things as well. You can see on this device here, there are two black square. One of them is a recorder, one of them is a stimulator. I have another uh, version that you can have a transparent top so you can see how the chip look like. So it's up, uh, up the recorder chip, uh, a three by three millimeter. Have, uh, uh, right now I have 10 recording channel and it's a uh, stimulator chip, have uh, eight channel. Um, yeah, but, and then the, but, the idea is that now we make it really small and very uh, low power. So in the future, you know, you can have this device it implant inside the arm with wireless power and wireless data transmission. You don't have any uh, wire coming out of the skin. You know, you can just record the signal inside, make the system uh, long term for long term uses. For for your um your stimulators, do, then. I, I know that that's not in this particular arm or something, but it's that's something you're working on, right? Yeah. So you have to like, have another. Uh, you have to have another um, neural network to that has to be learned for an individual's what what touch feels like to me in my mind, my brain, my nerves is different than the next person's, right? Just the same as the other direction. Mm -hmm. so, so you have the, to learn it. Yeah. So the neural feedback, you know, this hand it had like it had all the hardware to do neural stimulator and actually we done a lot of uh, touch experiment with this hand it's just because uh the, the challenge right now is like having the recorder and stimulator work at the same time so when you deliver electrical stimulation you can create a huge you know voltage spike that can mess up the recorder if you don't you know, do it properly so uh, our a lot of our work right now is trying to uh when you do stimulation, right, you try to remove this kind of uh, yeah, noise, basically. <laughs> so we call it uh, stimulation artifact, so that uh, the recorder and the AI doesn't you know, interfere by this thing. And so, yeah, kind of science. What, 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 oops, sorry. Yeah. What, what was your other question again? So. Kind of one of the other kind of science fiction versions of this is you'd be able to, to control things other than your hand, a prosthetic hand, let's say a helicopter or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's kind of a, a fun thing that we do because, you know, we have uh, can make the, the, the patient play video game by, uh, you see, the output of the prediction is just zero and one, right? So instead of mapping to the control of the finger. What if we just map into a, a keystroke on a computer? And in this case, you know, we have a patient say, we map the wiggling the index for uh, a W key on a keyboard so you can move forward and we go another finger to move backward and another finger to do other thing. In this case, you, know, you can play any video game you know, on the computer with your nerve. And wow. 
can you help me share a screen? I can show you a, a short video uh, for this. Uh, first, I have to apologize. So this video is you know, it's just a short demonstration record from someone's cell phone. So it's not really, uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, we definitely wow. have better video. Okay. Next time. you are controlling the helicopter. Left and right. um, the video moving forward. Tomorrow you cannot so essentially they're controlling it just by thinking. There's no fizzle. Yes. Like, yeah. It's not like the hand is touching the keyboard. They're yeah. just... Yeah, wow. so okay. yeah, so completely uh you know playing it by the they thought and <laughs> and you know just symbol like mapping in this case, you know, I map the middle finger to moving forward and mapping the thumb okay. to moving left, moving right, and making the fist to to shoot with the helicopter. Oh, okay. So basically like the W A S D or arrow mm -hmm. keys. And yeah. you just think like, okay, I'm gonna touch forward arrow to go forward and it just moves it that and what's the latency like on that uh it should, should be that it's actually uh, faster much faster than the Jetson because uh, the patient nerve the just hook up directly to the computer running a, a full gpu so you oh. get something like 10 20 millisecond uh input lag That's and awesome. you know the you know because you can map it to anything you don't have to play video game you can you use it to control virtual reality or uh, you know, control a drone control a robot or whatever you can imagine could you in theory control so it's still the nerve sensors in your arm so you'd still be yes. limited to doing finger-like motions wow. but could you in theory oh, have it be more expressive and control more actions than than just fingers yeah that oh, in, uh, because we are looking at signal from uh, the nerve signal right that. here so you can only look at something like around your hand if you have to move more uh, different kind of uh, decoding different information that you should have the it implied in the brain or something somewhere else to control this i think a lot of uh, other company and research group be looking at the uh, brain implant uh, as well uh, our approach is because first and foremost we are looking at um, having amputees so we, we we choose the the nerve implant it have a very uh, the the advantage of nerve implant compared compared to brain implant it are, it a lot safer so you can you know your nerve is very um, you can cut up a nerve and it's gonna grow back you know you know so in case anything like happen it, there are um, a lot less likely to damage, you know, have a long-term uh, consequences. So I'm look, I'm uh, hoping like in maybe five, 10 years when the nerve implant technology is involved, a lot safer, everything integrated, you know, even he healthy patient like myself and Marcus can receive a nerve implant and do a bunch of things without thought, <laughs> right? Not just amputees or, uh, you know, patient. I think this is every science science fiction fantasy and nightmare scenario <laughs> <laughs> all at once. Cy Cy cyberpunk. <laughs> what, yeah. what are you looking at? Reminds me of the Johnny Mnemonic, like an 80s movie with Keanu yeah. Reeves. and yeah, no, you, you never know, right? Maybe one day your process hand is even better than your biological hand. <laughs> I'm not sure it's strong, about willing stronger, to cut the hand to, yeah, stronger, more perfect. Stronger. Yeah. Well, that's the hypothesis of why your brain processes so much better than other animals is you have a hand, a puzzle thumb. It took you several thousand years to be able to uh, develop that neural network. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But exactly. joking aside, I have to say it's still a long way to go because your hand, the dexterity, it just unmatched, you know. If oh, you look at your body, right, your hand is actually one of the most complicated uh, neuromuscular system that you can process. It can do a lot of incredible things. The dexterity is just way beyond any mechanical system that you can, can see. So even though you can make a, a robotic hand that a lot stronger, you know, there are a long way to go to the dexterity for it to match your actual real hand. So speaking of the future, what are your future plans for research and development of this? And what are you most excited about? 
Yep. So uh, in the short term, you know, we we still trying to optimize the system. The market trying to try to optimize to run faster, more efficient, and I'm trying to make the the the, the neural interface uh, uh, fully implantable, everything wirelessly, nicely packaging, and you know, to for long term uses, and it in in our uh, immediate future, in the longer future, we are. Um, also working on several different projects that using nerve interface and AI for uh, for health healthcare application to treat and uh, diagnose the neurological disease. Could you imagine like you if you extract the nerve signal from your nerve or your brain and then use the AI to process the signal, right? You can not only can control a processes, you can predict you know if the when the patient you have a, a seizure, for example, or predict uh, help a patient with Parkinson's disease and all kinds of different uh, application, uh, biomedical and healthcare application. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So you mentioned having the neurosensor implant actually fully embedded in, in somebody's arm, because I think right now it just has like some wires coming out, so it's only in there temporarily while you're performing the study with them. So if it was actually, you know, fully under their skin and wireless, um, like how long would the battery life be of that? Or how would you charge that sensor and transmitter? So I would say it uh, should be wireless is power. So the power is uh, beaming from outside to inside. That you, oh. So <laughs> when, wow. when you use a device, you know, you should have an external P that uh, power up the device inside and then extract the data out. Okay. Almost like the wireless charging on your phone. So you just like put a little... watch. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then imagine the distance maybe a few centimeters at most. So most of the commercial system, uh, wireless charging power uh, should should work, you know. <laughs> yeah, that, that's incredible. <laughs> and you no know, one of our most important job is that make the neural interface chip that it consumes very, very low amount of power. The recorder chip, is, you can look at that like a few uh, microwatt, maybe 10 of microwatt at most. And the stimulator chip is a few milliwatt. So you don't have, you don't require a lot of power to run this, this chip. Uh, so you can you know, just use uh, you know, wirelessly power of this device. Is it difficult to implant those and like actually attach it to the nerve bundles or do they just kind of like stick it in? This is coming from somebody with no like, medical background so i don't really know what's all involved with that so i'm not involved in the, the surgery but um from dr kiefer and dr chen told me it's really easy to them <laughs> to do it um, that's, that's great yeah it take up um, uh, um maybe we can share the screen and show you the, how the micro electro look like let me show So this oh, probably have a warning if people don't, if people don't want to see. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's here yeah, how the micro electro look like. So we uh, slide it into in your fascicle in each nerve. So each of your nerve have around uh, a few three, two or three different fascicle, and then you know we have micro electro along. Uh, this is the, the micro electro contact. And then you slide it inside the nerve and then seal everything up. And then the wire running outside uh, through the skin that we can connect it to our recorder and all those things. And uh, so all our um, implantation is done by Dr. Jonathan Chen at U UT Southwestern in uh, Dallas. And he, 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 from what he told me, right? So this thing, um, you know, if he can tr train different doctors, like everyone should be able to do it. Every doctor, not everyone, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Still need some training. <laughs> yeah, still need a uh, training. So I think to say it's not for the faint of heart and that we're all just going to be walking around with these. But if you're an amputee and you're faced with the prospect of, you know, regaining that motion, then it seems like something that they would highly consider. And I, I think the the feedback that you've gotten from the people in your trial has been very positive. Um, 
coming from the other devices that they've used. Yeah, so uh, uh, that uh, along with the project, right, we have surprised a lot of our amateur patients because, you know, if you are amateur, you realize that uh, what you can do with the commercial system is very limited, have very little control of the of the hand rather than open and close. So when we can make, you know, the you know, in your finger and then make everything wireless, so everything portable, right? They just, uh, yeah, okay. I think let the patient talk by himself to be. Uh, oh. We have a video of the patient talking about it. Um, oh, cool. You know, like, um, once you get the hang of it, I guess it, it's, it just, I don't know. It's like, it's very close to like a natural intention. And then we have another patient, no, oh, he's experienced. Programmed, like I said, it's just open control. So I feel programmed, like I said, it's just open control. So I feel like, you know, once this thing is fine tuned, and the finished product is out there, it will be more lifelike, more lifelike function to be able to do everyday tasks without thinking of what position the hand is in or what mode I've got the hand programmed in. It's just if I wanted to reach and pick up something, I just reach and pick up something. If I wanted to uh, point at something, I think it would be easier just because the, the programming just to point and knowing that it's uh, just like my sound hand, just everyday function. And I think, I think we'll get there. I really do. That's awesome. Yeah. And it, it would seem a lot of this is by virtue of being able to decode those complex, noisy signals into intelligible actions, which if you were just looking at the data would just almost seem random since it's different for everybody but the the model that you guys made is able to do just that yeah so that's something that you have to experience it to actually know so i cannot talk for uh, all the amputee but uh, yeah that's a, a way a lot a huge difference between what already available on the market and you know the, the nerve interface that we are working on it kind of an entirely different world out there and you have to experiment it to really tell yeah, it's, it's really in, incredible game-changing work that, that you guys are doing in that area. So we're coming back to the top of the hour here, and it's been an incredible episode. Thank you, Jules and Marcus, for joining us. Dana, Jim, you have any last uh, questions that you would like to ask or any last questions from the audience? Let's see if there's somebody have any questions. I think somebody Thanks. asked how much it cost. <laughs> <laughs> It, it will cost you an arm and a leg. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's fine. I think that closes it down. <laughs> <laughs> it's really incredible. It's a uh, you all should feel really wonderful that you're working on something that's that's so meaningful and you know can really help help people. Oh, this is like I love magic. seeing projects. It's great, yeah. I, it's I think wonderful. it's safe to say the prototype is like always super expensive but you guys do envision that at some point these will be can be mass produced you know years down the road and actually be something that uh people could buy or get through their health care insurance for that type of thing right yeah absolutely we definitely were working towards this goal that's awesome okay well, guys, thank, thank you again, Jules, Marcus, for enlightening us with everything you're doing and showing us the the all the different aspects that you worked on to bring this system together. Really did, you know, bring in a lot of electromechanical uh, technology along with sensors and deep learning, not to mention it involves actual people. And we haven't really talked about anything like that on our show yet. Biology. So, bi <laughs> yeah. Medical, so. yeah. It's just a ton. Yeah, thank you for having us. I'll be blessed to be here. Yeah, oh, you're you're very welcome, and thanks 
for taking time out of your busy research schedule for us. So, uh, and thanks everybody who joined the live stream today and for all of your questions. And uh, with that, yeah, we will see you next month. So take care, everybody. Have a great evening, afternoon, morning. Everybody wave. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.